and welcome all you wonderful listeners and watchers. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, welcome to Royals, Rebels, and Romantics, Women's History Month style. And we're continuing to talk about some of the fascinating women in history. Now, I have the wonderful opportunity, some of you know this, of going to Ireland with Smithsonian Journeys in May. And so I've been doing some research on interesting people in Irish history, and I've asked, of course, my own Lindsay Lindstrom, our creative director, to help me do some research. And she found for us someone wonderful, and I wanted to share her with you as well. It's Grace O'Malley, and I know that's the anglicized version of her name. That is the one I can pronounce. But Grace O'Malley, who is one of the most famous pirates in the world, and certainly one of, or absolutely the most famous female pirate in the world. So I want to share some of the stories about her with you and take you on a journey with her through Ireland. All right. So we have Grace O'Malley, who is the Irish queen, Irish pirate queen. And here she is. And, you know, she just looks fascinating and wonderful. And so who was Grace O'Malley? What do we know about her? What can we know about her? There aren't a ton of records. Of course, during this time, she was a 16th century pirate queen. There aren't a ton of records of women <laughs> or of pirates. So we have to kind of do some deep digging. And some of this is based on some legends, but they're all part of the story. So she was born around 1530 in Western Ireland in County Mayo and was the daughter of an Irish chieftain in the kingdom of Umhall. Now, Ireland at this time had its own distinct legal system and chieftains were elected. So it didn't necessarily pass from father to son, but the more forceful chieftains um, offered protection to some of the smaller clans to gain more and more power. And so there was sort of a status or a hierarchy of chieftains. And women in Ireland, even though they weren't equal to men, they could inherit and hold lands in their own right. And so sometimes they were themselves as landowners protected by these chieftains. The thing a, wom a woman couldn't do is become a chieftain herself. Well, until Grace, and she is the one who broke the mold in her day. This is according to Ann Chambers, one of her biographers. We'll look a little bit more about some of the things Ann Chambers had to say. But Grace is someone who really became a powerful chieftain in her own right and was both pirate and leader. It's just a wonderful story. So her family, the O'Malley's, were a seafaring family. Now, many of the families in that time in the area where she lived were farmers, but instead the whole O'Malley clan was a seafaring family. Now there was a little plundering, a little control of the coast. They did tax people who fished or did any kind of business near their waters. And Grace O'Malley grew up at Belclair Castle on Clare Island. And in her education, she was trained to speak Latin as well as Gaelic. And she really wanted to go to sea. She was drawn to the sea. Now, there's a story that she told her father she wanted to go to sea with him. And he said, well, a girl can't go to sea. Your long hair, as you see there, would get caught in the ship ropes. And so, according to this legend, Grace cut off all her hair and forced her him to take her with him. Now, all the images we have of Grace, she does have long hair, but it's possible that she cut off her hair so that she could go to sea. That's the kind of spirit she had, even as a younger girl. Now, Ann Chambers again says, it is her leadership at sea that sets Grace O'Malley apart from every other documented female leader in history. So we are going to look at her leadership at sea. From the time she went with her father, she was hooked to the sea life, was very excited to live at sea and wield her power at sea. So we're going to take a look at this. Now, she was married off or married at age 15 to Donald O'Flaherty 
and he was heir of a neighboring chieftain. So that's one of the ways the chiefs grew. The chieftains grew their power, just like the noble families were doing in England is through marriage. And she had three children with Donald, two sons, Owen and Mora, and a daughter, Margaret. And Donald taught her not only about seafaring, but about piracy as well. He, her husband, was murdered by a rival clan, the Joyces, in 1560. And so Grace O'Malley took charge of all of the ships and his lands and all the people who worked for him. Now, the Joyces, they, they knew everybody knew they were responsible for Donald's death, but they thought they could just take his castle because they'd killed the man after all. But it turns out they had not expected his widow to be willing to fight for what she believed was hers. And she did. She was fearless. And she is sometimes described as vengeful after all these people had killed her husband. And so she fought for his lands. And then she had a lover, Hugh de Lacey, and he was killed by another clan, the McMahons of Duna Castle. And she was so angry about that, that she stormed Duna Castle and killed everyone involved in her lover's death. And that is when she got the nickname, the Dark Lady of Duna, because she took over that castle as well as having claimed her former husband's castles. So she continued to amass land and castles uh, like Rockfleet Castle here. Um, the, the legend of the pirate queen is being born at this time because through marriage and through fighting, she's gaining castles, she's getting land. And here's one of the things that Chamber says about her, enduring danger and hardship by land and especially by sea, O'Malley's maritime skill gave her role as a leader, a double edge. So she could fight successfully on land at sea. And she displayed immense skill and courage during this time. So as she's acquiring castles and land and power, she's becoming more and more well known. Now, she does marry again in 1566 to Richard the Iron. That's his nickname. Some great nicknames coming out of this, Burke. And his castle, Rockfleet, that we looked at a minute ago, might have been one of the motivating factors for her to marry him. So she married for castles and she fought for castles. And he was a member of the powerful McWilliam family. And it was a great match. Now, interestingly, at this time, you could enter into a trial marriage. So you sort of tried each other out for a 12-month period. And then O'Malley and her man, so she had people loyal to her and not to her husband, they locked him out of his Rockfleet castle, and she declared, I dismiss you. And with that, she said the marriage was over. Actually, they did reconcile. He stood up to her, and they got together again, and they were together for almost 20 years. So I guess, although she dismissed him once, he won her heart again. They had a son whose name was Tibbet, which was um, anglicized to Theobald. And he was born in 1567. And the legend is that he was born at sea just as the Barbary pirates were bearing down on her ship. So only an hour after giving birth to her son, she wrapped him in a blanket and got her sword and armed herself and rallied her men. And they were able to defeat the other pirates and move forward and actually gain even more wealth. And so that's the kind of legend. Now, it you know may have had his roots in reality. We don't really know with all these legends, but these are the stories that are told about her. And she was certainly a woman to be feared in her time. And she loved living on the seas. Unfortunately, when she went to plunder the Earl of Desmond's estates in Munster, she was captured and imprisoned. Now, she probably, in fact, 100% did not dress like this. I mean, in, with all the other pictures we've looked at, this one is sort of the funniest. In fact, I was thinking, what could I wear for a show about piracy? 
And I thought of something just like this. I really didn't. But anyway, this is a display at Westport House. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But there is a big display there because it's owned by Grace's descendants. So this is an idea of what she may or may not not have looked like in prison. But in any case, she was imprisoned until early 1579 when she secured a release. And no one knows exactly how. Did she escape? Did she bribe someone? I mean, this shows her with a whole lot of jewels that nobody took away from her. In any case, it's not really known how she escaped, but escape she did. And they continued, she and her friends and her men and her women and her supporters continued to fight and to regain the wealth that had been lost while she was in prison. Now, her husband died in 1583, and as a widow again, she, of course, went and took her husband's property as she had a legal right to do. Often, however, it wasn't quite that simple for a widow to get the property and the wealth that should have come to her, but boy, Grace always got it. She fought hard for it if someone stood in her way. And she established herself at Rockfleet. That castle I showed you earlier, it was a really great stronghold for her. And she was leading and commanding respect. And so even the neighboring clans really um, respected her and they had some obligations. They would protect each other. And she was so influential. She became a matriarch and gained control and influence over a broader and broader period and space. I mean, in Ireland, more and more lands were under either her direct control or through an alliance with her. And so she was becoming more and more powerful. And uh, that did not make the English very happy. So Sir Richard Bingham sort of went on a personal crusade to get back at Grace O'Malley, someone he said what had nursed to was a nurse to all rebellions in the province for 40 years. Now, of course, he's meaning that as a huge insult. But when you think about it, he's crediting her for all these successful rebellions over a 40 year period. This man who doesn't believe that she should have any power, that she should have any rights as a woman and as a rebel is actually giving her a lot of credit. He was right. And he really set himself up against a powerful enemy. So he went after her. Here he is. And he lured um, her son, Owen, into a situation where Bingham's brother was able to murder Grace's oldest son, Owen. And this both devastated and infuriated Grace O'Malley. And so she led a force against Bingham and was captured for a while. And so this force between them, these battles between them went back and forth. And in fact, he had her condemned to die but her son-in-law managed to persuade the English that, in fact, she wouldn't be part of any rebellion and he would keep O'Malley quiet and everything would be fine. And so she was released and was not executed. Now, Bingham is still working against her, but while he's away, he's visiting someone else or fighting against someone else. Grace O'Malley took, took advantage to this and started making um, gestures and establishing contacts with Queen Elizabeth I. She began writing letters to Queen Elizabeth I. She wasn't going to mess around with Bingham anymore. She's going straight to the top. And the letters to Elizabeth show how bright and alert and strategic she was in what she was complaining about and what she was asking for. And in retaliation against this, uh, Bingham captured her son and accused him of treason. So now her, your younger son, Theobald, has also been imprisoned by Bingham, who, remember, had her first son murdered. So Grace is so upset that she requests, she goes to the Earl of Ormond, who is one of her very influential friends, who's also very influential at court and actually distantly related to Queen Elizabeth I and manages to get an audience. So Grace goes to England, to London, 
and has a personal audience with Queen Elizabeth I at Greenwich Palace in July of 1593. And here's an engraving showing that, you know, Elizabeth dressed as she always is. And um, Grace is not quite wearing that pirate outfit that we saw in the prison image, but um, here is how this is depicted. I'll talk a little bit more about a stage play about Grace O'Malley, but here is this meeting depicted on stage. And you can sort of imagine these two legendary women. This meeting actually happened, unlike, for example, the meeting between Queen Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots that did not happen. Yes, she did meet with the pirate queen indeed. And in fact, the two of them were able to speak English because Grace O'Malley had learned English as well. So she was very um, forthright with Elizabeth and she um, asked about um, lands that she wanted and rights and her son to be released and was very forthcoming with the queen. The queen did allow her to recover her losses and allowed her to return to quote, maintenance by land and sea. Remember, that's very similar to her family's motto, power by land and sea. And so the queen is really granting her that. And in fact, even though it was a brief meeting, Elizabeth was impressed. And when a new map of Ireland was drawn up, O'Malley was named on that map as the chieftain. Remember something women can't be. Oh, yes, they can. She was named as the chieftain of Mayo. So there may have been a little bit of kindred spirit women ruling in something they're really not supposed to be in. That was at least the story that both of these women were given. So O'Malley continued to lead her men at sea well into her 60s. So just like Elizabeth kept ruling and ruling longer than maybe people expected her to and survived dangers, so did Grace O'Malley. And as she got well into her 60s, things began to change. And the Battle of Kinsale in 1602 put an end to a very broad rebellion and allowed Ireland to fall into English hands. And this was a whole upheaval of the Gaelic way of life that Grace's ancestors had lived by and everything. The whole chieftain way of life crumbled at the turn of the century there in 1602. Now, Henry Sidney, who was um, one of Elizabeth's courtiers, who was a politician and who was also Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, said this, that Grace displayed feminine sea captain. He identified her as that famous for her stoutness of courage, commanding three galleys and 200 fighting men. And just think for a minute what it's like for somebody like Henry Sidney, who knows what he's talking about, to praise a woman who is commanding three separate galleys and 200 men. This was the most notorious woman in all the coasts of Ireland. And again, notorious, I know that has sometimes a negative context, and yet that this would be used for grace, for her demonstrating how unfailing her courage was, her determination, how hard she went at it all the time. It's also very much a compliment. Now, Grace died in 1603, the same year that Queen Elizabeth died, and she died at Rockfleet in that castle. And the story is that she was buried here in the Abbey on Clare Island. Her legacy continues in all kinds of ways. And one of the things that, again, Ann Chambers, her biographer, says about her, Grace O'Malley did not conform to the patriotic, God-fearing, dutiful image of Gaelic womanhood promoted by later generations of Irish historians and was consequently airbrushed out of history. And that's one of the reasons we have to just look for scraps and pay attention to some of these legends that have sustained themselves and have prevailed because she didn't fit the picture that later historians decided that Irish women should be at the time. And so there is a loss. And I will have a link to Ann Chambers' book about Grace O'Malley. It's a really great biography of her. So her legend continues. And I just want to show you some of the ways that you can find her. For example, in the Pirate Party game, here she is, Pirate Captain Grace O'Malley. And so 
even card games do honor her and give her, of course, she's really a chieftain, not just a captain. Also, the famous Grace O'Malley Irish whiskey. We have to mention that. Many, many pubs named after her. And I do want to mention the Pirate Queen, which debuted in 2006 in Chicago and did move to Broadway, as you see here in 2007. It did not have a particularly long run and is unfortunately right now not playing anywhere, although it did receive a Drama Desk Award nomination for Outstanding Featured Actress. And that was actually for Queen Elizabeth instead of Grace. So unfortunately, the actress playing Grace did not get an award nomination. It was performed for the first time in the UK in 2015 at Hampton Hill Theater in London. And it was presented at Hale Center Theater in West Valley, Utah. I'm from Utah. I've been to shows at Hale Center Theater. Unfortunately, I have not seen this one there, but maybe it will come back. So everybody keep a lookout. And then at a charity concert in 2020, some parts were performed there as well. So keep your eyes out. If you see the Pirate Queen, you now know this is about Grace O'Malley. Now, I do want to mention Westport House, which was bought in 2017 and restored, and you can now go visit and even stay there. But the family are direct descendants of Grace O'Malley. And so they have the statue outside that's of her was from Westport House. This one, that display that's in the basement showing her in a dungeon, that's there as well and is open to visitors. So I hope you've enjoyed learning about Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen, a woman in history maybe we haven't learned enough about. And again, I will include some links in the show notes so you can learn more. But as we come to the end of our time together, I want to thank you so much for listening. I want to thank you for watching if you happen to be watching on YouTube. And I want to so, so sincerely thank you for joining me in this journey through history as we keep shaking up history together. Thank you. Thank you.